between. We hear the the cool, interesting dynamics of is that what is that texture behind you? Is that concrete? What is that? It's uh, like a textured brick thing. Okay. So yeah, they're underneath here. It would all be red, like this, but it's painted. But gotcha. Hmm. You're seeing four dudes on your screen who are talking about the rooms that they're in. As whiskey talk will be getting. Going momentarily here on the Ben and Skin YouTube channel, as well as any and all Facebook mechanisms that blast out whiskey talk. It is whiskey talk. I'm MySpace. talking. In the meantime, oh, we on yeah. MySpace. In the meantime, it's room talk, right? Room talk, and Ooh. it's actually it's blending room. Do you call it the blending room? Yeah. Blending room talk, and I'm I'm looking over your shoulder. That's Jared Hempstead. I'm looking over your shoulder, and I love all the interesting colors that I see too. Some stuff. Yeah, man. Mm. We ought to do a whole whiskey talk on what happens in the blending room. But I see Alex over there. He's always wearing a damn fine hat. Ben, who has been thrust into the position of whiskey talk right. engineer, is getting everything settled where he oh. is. And if you're Not joining us this. now. We will be momentarily getting this with Ben. What are you looking for over there? One more piece we're supposed to have connected. Okay. So, but, uh, you know, sometimes it happens without that piece. Sometimes should, it bees like that. We should have had a Dave Grohl entry music. Oh my God. Wasn't it great hearing from Dave Grohl today? Man, that was, it, that, I, that was a great interview. It was very, it just seemed relaxed and casual and he seemed to have a good time with it. He, uh, he just, you know, you always sort of, uh, when you see people in a lot of different, famous people in a lot of different environments and they sort of carry themselves a certain way, you kind of like project onto them what you think they are. Yeah. Right. Like, okay, I think he's a down ass dude and he's a regular guy. And if you had a chance to hang out with him, he wouldn't be star tripping because there's a quality to him that's a nerd quality of truly being enamored with music and obsessive about it. And I think those are things that kind of normalize people as opposed to being on a star trip. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that that sort of comes across whenever I see him interviewed. And I felt like that sort of came across today too. I, well, I thought it was, I thought it was really good that you asked about his, uh, his, I, I know he has, I think he said two daughters. I don't know. Is it three daughters? Three daughters, but one's real young. One's real young. Yeah, it was like 14, 11, and six or something. Yeah. But I just, I thought that was a really great question. I bet nobody really asks about his kids that much. It was, it was a total like, hey, look at me question. Because I remember uh, in the last, I don't know, year or something, I read a comment where he said, Billie Eilish is rock and roll. And mm. he was talking about his daughter being into Billie Eilish. And that's how I discovered Billie Eilish was my daughter's way into her. Yeah. So we would listen to it together. And I was like, man, I really dig this artist. And hearing how my daughter feels about these songs got me invested in her songs in a way that I probably wouldn't have if I was just casually listening. So I, I had a feeling that he was going through a similar experience just the way he had talked about her or whatever. So. Hey, Ben, is it, did, is it true that your brother almost ran over Dave on his, either on his way or from the studio? Is that true? I, no, I didn't. I, I didn't know like that. You, you probably just haven't seen the email yet, Ben. We're just going to read this damn email. Don't you okay. think, Alex? I know Alex. Yeah, no, you, you should read it, Skin. You have the okay. voice of a, just an electric voice, so please. It's true. Uh, this is from Ben's brother, and I did a little quick timeline in my head. I'm assuming this is when he was in Austin doing Sonic Highways, but maybe not. True story. As the light abruptly turned red, I stopped a little too far on a crosswalk on, Cron on Congress Avenue, probably five or six years ago. After coming to a complete stop, I realized I was too far out but couldn't move because there was someone behind me in a giant truck. I immediately apologized to the only pedestrian crossing the street. Turns out it was Dave F. and Grohl eating a slice of pizza, and he was <laughs> gracious as F., he almost enjoyed that there was some interaction and took a few moments to engage in it. Let me know and let me know that it was cool. He crossed the street, the light turned green, and then we both went on to build upon our respective music legacies. <laughs> <laughs> wow. That's awesome. 
somehow I missed the detail that it was it was five or six years ago. I literally thought like that happened today. Like, Man, oh, what, yeah. are the, what are the chances? Yeah. Whoa. You know, uh, I, I will say this about the Dave Grohl interview. Um, I was excited to hear it and, and the hubbub leading up to it. So many people were excited about it. When you meet somebody who is famous, whether in whatever capacity, we have an expectation or a hope that they're going to be cool or humble or normal, but it doesn't always go that way. Mm -hmm. That guy seemed to be, you know, Dave Grohl seemed to be really humble, normal for a God of music, um, seemed to be at the maximum level of likability and authenticity. Yeah, he was so, he was so casual. And I think you, you were out of frame then, but, um, I just thought that skin asking about his kids was, uh, was really smart. And I think it, it, it brought down the interview even more so to just a very casual and likable level. To where, I mean, I don't obviously I don't know Dave Grohl, but he's always seemed like, yeah, it's like, man, is that guy really nice, or is he, is he like a jerk, you know? And and just like he's just has this attitude because he's mm -hmm. yeah been around for thirty years, like in the in the limelight for you know rock legend. So I don't know, it was really cool. He was way nicer than I expected, and he wasn't dry and boring. I don't know, it's cool. Yeah. So, so let me ask you guys this. Are we broadcast uh, broadcasting Whiskey Talk at the moment as we sort of ease into our uh, our digital broadcast here? I mean, I hope so. Yeah. But, you know, I mean, yeah, I'm not, really an, live. <laughs> not okay. really an engineer. I'm just a guy drinking whiskey. All right. That's really all any of us are <laughs> in this world is just guys drinking whiskey. So welcome to Whiskey Talk. This is the uh, special follow up to the single barrel selection show that I believe won some Emmys. Um, I'm daytime, Jeff daytime Emmy. They were what daytime Emmys. They okay, were daytime. daytime. Yeah, but you know, an Emmy's an Emmy. We beat Susan Lucci or whatever her name is. Uh, I'm Skin. That's Ben. The other guy in the glasses. We're the Ben and Skin show, and we're just sort of like the mods of this conversation because the stars of this bad boy, number one, the sexy man in the hat. He's the man about town. Uh, when we did our uh, appearance at the little elm goody goody a week or so ago he was there answering all the questions and people ate it up he's alex elrod let's just call him balcones brand ambassador around state is that a good description sure okay good great the other other really sexy bearded guy is the man who makes it all happen he's your head distiller there at balcones down in waco it's the mighty jared hempstead hello jared how we doing homie you good, man. Doing good. Kicking ass in the blending room, I see. Usually getting my ass handed to me in the blending room. Like, <laughs> Maybe that's for a later broadcast, getting into yeah. the intricacies of blending. But let's start with some clapping as uh, the single barrel selects made it out into the wild. The last time we did a whiskey talk, Ben selected his single barrel which is this Rumble Cask Reserve with the great artwork of Ben there on the side from Mick Jimenez. We had three different single barrels that Jared had pulled aside of Rumble because Ben indicated that might be the one he wants to go for. He made a selection. And then I went into the single malt realm. There's uh, Mick's great work of me. That's before I had a mullet. And uh, this is a peated single malt. And uh, it's been really really great to have these at the house i've enjoyed drinking them and that's what we're going to do uh the tasting on today before we um get into all this uh and start doing the tasting and, and talk about what we have here um how, how did the single barrel program go for you guys i'll start with you alex how did uh the way that this went down and you know actually got out into the public how did how did you feel about all this uh, I thought it was really fun. Uh, the turnout and response was, um, I mean, it was, yeah, it was really fun. We had uh, folks lining up outside, maybe 70 to 80 plus people, um, including my mom. <laughs> so shout out to Sandra. She might be watching. I don't know. She watches hey, Sandra. <laughs> yeah. Um, she was there uh, along with a lot of other folks. Um, a, a good distillery friend of ours named Greg, uh, Whiskey Dramster on Instagram also showed up. Um, but a lot of other folks um, saw a bunch of Roller Town gear, um, saw, uh, you know, just a lot of familiar faces and then a lot of new faces that showed up that were just like, hey, we've fallen in love with Balcones, excited about this. 
you know, here's my budget. What should I buy and how should I expect it? And then we had a couple of random people that were like super, super nerdy whiskey drinkers. I mean, like it was a full spectrum, which I think was really great. Um, everyone was really nice. Everybody wore masks. Everyone, no one was all, you know, on top of each other. Um, we, we rolled up the wrestling mat. So we canceled that section of the, the uh, Saturday morning. Um, you know, unfortunately, of course, because of COVID, it would have been nice to be able to pop some bottles, not champagne, but the single barrels uh, right. for folks to try. But um, of course we couldn't. And that's okay. Cause everyone was still very um, gracious, even about the price point. People were like, I'm excited. This is awesome. Can we take photos, sign bottles? Um, I brought a, a few extra stickers for the first folks that got there. Um, I think overall experience, I would, you know, I would say a plus. I mean, I thought it was great. It was fun. Sold a lot of bottles. Goody goody seemed to be very excited and pleased with the turnout. Um, I know the distillery were excited to have this this whiskey um, and the Rumble, which is not a whiskey, of course, uh, out in the world. So um, I'm very pleased with uh, with the day. You know, Ben, uh, I know you dug seeing Raymond from DFW Whiskey Club out there. The DFW Whiskey Club people were so good to be a part of this. And also the great Ben and Skin listener Juanito was there actually in the whiskey aisle telling people about Valcona is it feels like, mm. you know, you came up with this phrase from Waco to the world to get everybody out there spreading the gospel. And I feel like we saw a lot of that last Saturday. Yeah, we did. It was, uh, I mean, I, I don't know if Jared and Alex understand when we say this, how freaking honored we are, but uh, to have our ugly mugs on the side of those beautiful bottles, it's, it's literally earrings uh, or I guess it would be, and uh, the pig would be a beautiful, majestic pig, and the earrings would be us, the terrible, ugly earrings. Uh, it's just a freaking honor. And we, we're huge fanboys of Balcones, and we sound like freaking homers because we love it so much. And uh, it's awesome to see the rest of the world feel the same way. You guys continue to stack up awesome awards and, and prestigious, uh, you know, just reviews, which uh, speaks volumes about the work that you do. But we're just in awe. And so when we're going out there to the goody goody, all right, we're freaking out because our faces are on bottles of Balcones and it's amazing. And we chose the barrels. And so, but we didn't know if there was going to be a big turnout or not. And so to see all those people in line, uh, to see how much love and support there was for Balcones and our show, um, it really meant a lot. It was uh, really, really special. I, I thought it was... Year. I don't know Jared might have jumped off. He's like, I'm over this already. Um, <laughs> uh, when Raymond was there, you know, he he hung out uh, in the back with again DFW Whiskey Club, uh, and we ended, I ended up seeing a couple other folks from the club uh, hanging out and everything. But Raymond was uh, really respectful because he was like, man, I've got people blowing me up from the club asking if if uh, he could mule bottles back, right? Where he buys a bunch of bottles and then they Venmo each other and share bottles. And I know he walked out of there, I think, with at least two, maybe three six packs. Um, you know, so maybe 18 bottles where he was going to then go, you know, some folks were like, Hey, I can't make it. I got this, you know, I got a cold morning soccer game with the kids or, mm-hmm. or whatever, and was able to grab some bottles to go, uh, and, and share those with folks from the club that couldn't make it out there. So that's always the cool thing about the, the whiskey community is that, you know, it's like, Hey, he's going to be out, you know, at least, I don't know, is that a, around a thousand dollars maybe, but he's like, that's cool. I know these other guys and gals that wanted this, that couldn't make it. They're going to be cool about it. They're going to Venmo me or, you know, cash app, whatever. And uh, it's all about sharing, which is really cool. Right. And same with the Bennett skin listeners. There's, there's people out there like t- chatting with each other and like, Oh, are you on the Facebook? Are you on the Facebook Ch- talking about one of the recent shows? It was just, it was really cool to see kind of all these uh, communities that live in the area kind of collide there. Um, s- social distance colliding, if you will. Um, and, uh, and be able to share oh. some, some stories. While we're waiting for Jared to rejoin us here, it looks like he had a technical issue. Uh, we did have our buddy Tim Urban out there yeah. to shoot video. And he shot a video, and we just put that out on social media uh, just about 30 minutes ago. So you can go find it on our social media channels, and you can see what it was like up there, the buzz. And I'm glad you brought up this safe social distancing and, and everybody wearing masks, because that's obviously very, very important to us as it is to you guys. Uh, but I think considering the... The atmosphere, the environment we find ourselves in with COVID and, and everything with this pandemic, I think it was as huge a success as there could possibly be. And the GM of the goody goody was giddy giddy. I mean, he was so <laughs> happy. He's like, man, I can't believe this. I can't believe the turnout. And um, 
you know, when people started lining up, he goes, yeah, it was before he let him in. He goes, yeah, sometimes we get lines out here. And he goes, but obviously you got a bunch of people coming out. I'm going to separate them. I'm going to put one group on one side and one on the other. And I didn't realize he had done that. And I walked back out to the front and I was like, oh my God, what happened to everybody? He's like, oh, those three people right there. And I was like, oh no, the only three people came <laughs> because those people are not here for you. I was like, oh, he goes, these people are. And it was a massive line. And it just felt so good to see that support, to see so much uh, excitement. And uh, the GM time and time again, kept coming back, checking in with us. He was super happy and uh, he seemed to be really happy with it. And we were happy. So it seems like it was a win, win, win. Yeah. Yeah. Sh shout out to Goody Goody just for the whole, uh, even uh, there's, you know, there's a lot of things behind the scenes that most people don't, don't really uh, realize all the logistics, right? Maybe the same with radio, all the, the, the seemingly the paperwork and, you know, the prepping and planning. And there's a ton of that involved to get, to get these cases moved around and um, from the distillery up to Dallas uh, and then into the correct goody goody at the correct, you know, I mean, there's a lot to it. And, uh, and goody goody was great about it. And it was seamless. It was, it was fantastic. So shout out to goody goody DFW whiskey club, Ben and skin and Santa showed up unexpected. Like, that Oh was crazy. yeah, that was cool. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. And you, that's it. That's a good segue there, Alex, because that kind of reminds us, you know, one of the things I know Ben did it, I did it too, you know, bought a couple extra bottles heading out the door because I think they're incredible gifts. And I think that's true with really any Balcones bottle that you decide to share. You know, the I think the the thing here is the slogan distilled to appreciate. Well, it's a lot cooler to appreciate something with somebody else, right? Have it be a communal experience. So I feel like sharing this great whiskey with people, uh, these great spirits with people, that's, that's, I know this has been a weird year, but I still think, you know, you can find some, some places to, to share with people. And so mm -hmm. that's the thing I think I'm most excited about is giving the gift of great bottles this holiday season. When you said Santa made me think of it. So even, I don't know, I'm sure we have a few bottles of the single barrel, uh, peated single bar, uh, barrel single malt at the Goody Goody and Little Elm, but any bottle of Balcones works great as a gift. If you see the Mirador out there, or you see Brimstone or uh, Rumble or anything that you see, keep in mind, those are great gifts. I just know those are the kind of gifts I like to get as well. So I think that makes a heck of a lot of sense. Same. Yeah. There he is. I don't know. Hi, Jared. I don't even He's know. He's back. Man. Interwebs. Yeah, I know. Uh, I did want to ask you this, and I know we, we probably <laughs> went over it a little bit last time, but now that you know Ben and I have gone through this whole experience, you were tasked with uh, you know finding those single barrels, and so we had three that we chose from. What went into so, you know narrowing it down to those three barrels in the first place for each one of us? Um, single barrels are kind of a weird thing. Um, uh, if you're doing it for a club or you're doing it for a specific venue, bar, chain, whatever, restaurant. Um, everybody kind of has a different approach. Some people want, uh, if they're like, if we were to take single malt, for example, um, they want to find a barrel that they feel like exemplifies. That's just like the quintessential, ex you know, version of what they love about that bottle. And then there's people that come in and go, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what the regular release tastes like. Where's the weird stuff, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so we kind of do a little bit of the same. People, people probably don't realize how much um, the consistency that they see in products on the shelf is absolutely because of blending it to a specific kind of profile. Right. Barrel variation is massive. Uh, I think regular not people that are in whiskey clubs and stuff because they do single barrel picks, but most people who just buy whiskey off the shelf, I think would be really surprised to be like, Hey, here's 20 bottle. Here's 20 barrels from the exact same day, the exact same fermentation, exact same distillation. And look how crazy the, the variety of, of how they taste and smell turns out right. just because right. they're, they're in barrels and those, those barrels at one time were trees and those trees were living things and their own soils and their own climates. And they had their own life for, 80, 100 years. Um, so when we're going through, I do a little bit of everything. I find things that are just like, you know, really exemplary of a certain thing, or I'm so familiar with 
how Rumble turns out at this age that if I find one that I'm like, ooh, hold on a second. This has got some really cool like citrus peel zesty stuff going on that we don't usually see. That deserves to be highlighted, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's a little bit of both. It's trying to understand who's on the other end, um, which of course, in this case, what an enigma. Been <laughs> Who could ever know? Who could possibly <laughs> understand the mind of, of uh, the, the man? But you do your best, right? So I can't remember what all we looked at. I know we looked at some finished. I think we had maybe like a sherry, like an Oloroso finish. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, I think the one he picked to me is actually one that is like, no, this is what this product is supposed to be. This is this yeah. product as its best self. And we, we can, you kind of passed on the weird outliers, but we threw those yeah. in because, you know, sometimes you get excited and you go, you know, that's fun. So, um, yeah. And then for you, we went a little bit more off the, off the map, but I know how much you like single malt. We've talked about that plenty, plenty, plenty of times hanging out. Yeah. Um, virtually on screen or in person. And so I knew what I was excited about that we've got coming up that we haven't released. And that's the kind of stuff I wanted to, to see if any of that's, you know, struck a chord with you but yeah well you did an excellent job i think capturing it for both of us and i know ben's is ecstatic with his as i am with mine and you hinted at something we'll get at later in the show but ben let's go in on the rumble cask reserve see that bad boy right there or is that sexy bastard that vested barrel one one six nine three it's a used bourbon barrel and this was bottled on september the 21st uh ben tell us a little bit about what you're tasting on yours brother well uh there was of the three there was one that i thought was more of an outlier than the other two mm -hmm. and it stood out immediately and i was like okay this is really unique but it's not my wheelhouse the other two it was a lot more difficult for me to decide and uh, it took some help from DFW Whiskey Club, obviously. And uh, we were kind of all linked up on the same page. Um, I think my favorite description of this is my wife tried it. When we, I brought the bottle home and she tried it. And my she, wife. Said, she <laughs> said, this tastes like Christmas. And I thought Ooh. that was my favorite thing ever. That's my favorite thing she could have said. And she was picking up, you know, cinnamon and she was picking up that sweetness and maybe detecting a little bit of that honey and i love it that you know this time of year you know she's in charge of all the christmas festivities put them putting up the decorations and stuff around the house and she's doing it with my nine-year-old daughter and it was on that day that i let her try it and i thought that was really perfect that she found some sort of a synergistic energy between the christmas mood she was in and how delicious this rumble tasted. So yeah, I, I couldn't be happier. And uh, you know, we were stoked that it sold out like quickly. Like we, we sold through all of it at one goody goody uh, in just a matter of hours. And so the feedback I'm, I'm hearing on it is, is off the charts awesome. And so I almost feel like uh, the compliment is a pass, a football pass that's being thrown to Jared since he made it. <laughs> and I step in because my dumb face is on the bottle and I intercept it and I take all the credit as I run down the sideline, and pick six it. But uh, Jared, everybody loves this rumble. Um, I love it. And just freaking honored to have my face on that bottle, dude. It's exceptional. I, I think that's one of the coolest things about the kind of current phenomenon of uh, everything from a restaurant or a chain liquor store, a little family mom and pop liquor store, whiskey club, or in this case, a radio show host picking their own barrels. There's a real cool um, kind of flattening of the industry that's been going on for a good decade now that seems to still be going only up, um, which I as a producer and also a whiskey fan, I find just the, it, all the barriers in between the people that drink the stuff and the people that make the stuff are just being knocked down and we're getting to uh just have so much more unmediated just absolute direct contact um and alex of course this is his bread and butter because he managed he, he handles the single barrel program for texas but there's something super cool about 
I mean, you called it an assist or what, you actually, you said an interception, which that's backwards. That wouldn't, <laughs> that's not, um, I was thinking about that the other day they were talking about, uh, uh, oh, I just went blank, uh, on football player just reached the, uh, 400, I think touchdown passes or younger than anyone else. Was it Rogers? Oh, Aaron Rogers? Oh, it was Mahomes. I, I, he doesn't have 400 already. Oh, he, he had I think it was Aaron, I think it was Aaron Rogers. Season. Rogers. Okay. I think it was Rogers. <laughs> Uh, which Ben Rogers. Okay. I, uh, right, right. but, um, anyway, I was think I actually was thinking about that while I was driving in the car, listening to the radio. It's kind of a weird thing. Cause somebody's still got to like catch that puppy and nail it. And like for that guy to get touched down, it's, it's more like an assist to me in basketball. Like you can hook somebody up. They, they flood the shot. Like, well, that's not an assist. So, um, <laughs> in the same way we, we make what we love, try to put in front of you things that we think would, would resonate. But at the same time, now we now you've participated, right? This would have existed either way, but this might have ended up in a blend or a bottling or ended up someplace else. But no, you picked it. So of there's 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 a there's a collaborative kind of uh, yeah I don't know. It's a cool thing for it to not just be kind of a one sided conversation where you've got the marketing team and you make this stuff and you cram it down people's throats and you tell them that they want it and you convince them that they want it and that they're willing to buy it. This is like, hey, what, what can we make together, you know? Um, I, and I don't poo-poo the picking because that's the last stage. And trust me, the picking, what happens in this room where I'm at is, I mean, it's, it's, it's crucial. So, um, yes, they already existed. But the picking, the choosing, the kind of getting into some of the subtlety and making some of those final decisions, is, it's, it's the last step and getting it ready. So, uh, yeah, don't downplay I your think- role. I think it says a lot about you that you even think that way because uh, you're, you're, it's almost like you're this guy who's making this whiskey for all the right reasons. And you'd really rather just get all this business out of the way. I understand we have a business, but let me just get to the people that love whiskey so we can all celebrate it together without you being on some other level. You're not like, ha ha, I make the whiskey. I am on the mountaintop. You know, you're like, Hey, let's all just enjoy it together, man. This is badass. And I think that says a lot about you and the whole reason you do what you do. I I think it's part of where I, I mean, I got into this, um, for those reasons. So, you know, I, I was, and still am on the other side of that. I'm, you know, I'm in secondary groups and I'm checking stuff and I'm buying stuff at auction and I chase actually these days I have this army of rad dudes like Alex uh in cities all across the state so i actually have them mostly doing my shopping for me because waco doesn't have that much stuff sometimes um but yeah we're still paying attention to what's coming out we're still going and chasing down stuff we're opening it we're talking about it um so it's really not that hard i don't have to imagine what whiskey chasers what whiskey collectors and kind of nerds and those folks are doing because i'm i'm doing it i just also happen to get to make it which is cool um, but you're absolutely right. I mean, the business side of stuff is, I don't know, I'm assuming, I'm, I, I would hope you guys feel the same way because the goal is to, is to do our, our trade really, really well and make something that matters um, way beyond just, oh, I got this thing that people like to buy. Um, and to do that, obviously, Bill's got to get paid. I want Alex to get paid. I want to get paid. Um, I'd like to grow this thing. I'd love to pay people great. I'd love for people to like make a life out of this and walk in here at 28 and at 65, they're walking out the door and this is what they did for a living. And they're proud of themselves. They're proud of what we made. They love who they work with. And if, if taking care of the business and being diligent with that is how we make that, if that, how we facilitate that, then that's fine. You know, I I love those old uh, pictures. Like you'll see from Kentucky where you see the whole staff, in 1913 and what they were working on. I think Mm -hmm. those things are really cool. I I wanted to throw this out there. Uh, I kind of have two ways that I drink or enjoy or get into this sort of stuff. One way is I'll just indulge, right? I'm going to put a record on or whatever. I'm going to relax. I'll have the tube on whatever, and then I'll pick something and I'll drink it. But I feel like what we're doing right now and what we do on a lot of these whiskey talks is there's also the idea of tasting something. And whenever I'm tasting something, one of the things that always strikes me is when I do go to the next mode of indulging, how would I want to indulge and what would I want to do? And on Ben's rumble, uh, when I drink it, I feel like I want to have a hot brownie right out of the oven with it. (laughs) You know what I'm saying? It's like, there's, 
I, I don't, I'm not saying that it's like some strictly dessert spirit or anything like that, but it totally takes me there. Like, man, this would be so great with a smoking hot brownie right out of the oven. Mm. Man. That's a great I, way to end the night right there. I, th I thought yeah. it was, it's a little bit drier than, I think the nose smells way sweeter than the palate and the finish are. I mean, it's yeah. still very rich, but um, I added quite a bit of water to it as well. Um, just to, to really kind of expand things. Um, so I, I don't have a, a dropper. Jared is using a, a really nice, um, pipette. Yeah, those are in the, the lab. Yeah. yeah. Those are the oh, really wow. nice ones. Yeah. That's like, those are like doctor grade pipettes, right? I, I don't know. Johnson, I don't have any lab experience, but I have guys that work here that do. So yeah, yeah. it's pretty cool. You like dial it in. You can, let me see if I can show oh. that. You can go down to like 0. 0.1 milliliters. That's so that's 8.0 milliliters. Wow. And then it kind of like pre-measures it when you push the plunger, it, it gets that much. Oh. So yeah, we use these in blending all the time. If you're trying to calculate, um, it's all of our samples in here, all of these jars that are single barrel, individual barrel samples that get brought to us from the warehouse um, are at a specific proof. And so if I'm working on, so like last week we were just finishing up lineage that needs to, that's going to be at 47. So if I'm trying to assess a barrel that's sitting at 63, 64%, I want to smell and taste it diluted so we can i can kind of pre-program that thing and get a sample put a little water in it and go but hey mm -hmm. i want to you you mentioned lineage too and not to get off mm -hmm. track but um we're super proud of you guys and i was mentioning that uh you know we're we're homers obviously we're fanboys of balcones but it just gives us credibility when the biggest whiskey publications on the planet think of you guys the same way that we do and and um in other words you get this amazing global respect and it was a whiskey advocate named lineage one of the top 20 whiskeys of of 2020 and i imagine jared you're probably the last one who wants to talk about this knowing you you're like that's that thank you very much but um we're proud of you guys we love seeing that and that's a really big deal and i'm just curious about how that made you feel i mean <clears throat> awards and those i mean yeah the competitions and award stuff is kind of weird and i think there's obviously a marketing value. And I think everybody in the industry gets that we've all been there where we're, we're walking around at HEB or someplace and we're trying to find wine. And we are like, I don't know anything about wine really. And you see numbers, you know, this vintage got a 96 or a 92 right. or whatever. Yeah. Um, so I think it does help for people who want to dabble and they're not really sure they need a little guidance when you see those old numbers and, uh, metals on the shelf. Um, <clears throat> for me, it's kind of cool because half the time these days we've been doing this for, I've been doing this for 12 years now, half the time I know some of the judges that are involved. So I know the panel. Um, and so it does mean a lot when, you know, you've got either scotch or bourbon, basically hall of famers that, you know, um, are people that own bars, people that buy for bars or chains, like, um, people in the media that write a lot about whiskey when those are the people that are on the panel. Um, it does, it, it's, it's just good feedback. It's a good feedback loop. I mean, it's, it's not, um, I don't know. It's, it is a weird thing, but that's, that's the most of the value I get out of it. When you go, you know what, we're really excited about something. I don't feel like we've had a ton of swing and misses in, in the last decade plus, but it's good when you're taking, you feel like you're stepping out a little bit. And you're waiting and like, oh man, I hope other people get what we were trying to do with this. And I hope they find it as nuanced and, 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 and kind of round it off as we did. And then when they do, you're like, oh, thank God. I, mean, I don't really, I've, it's happened what, good enough over the last 10 plus years. That I don't really second guess it too much anymore, but it, you're, you're still waiting for some of that. And really with this product specifically, between the proof and the price point, we had a goal in mind that it would help move the conversation about American single malt forward a little bit. Yeah. Um, and that's actually more validating maybe to me than just what's in the bottle. We wanted something that to, just like we talked about with pot still, like there's, there's barriers that keep people away from things. And I really hoped this product would not just, not just for us, but for all of our, all of our American single malt buddies and peers all across the country um, who have been fighting this fight for a decade, two decades, some of them um, that this, the price is inhibitive or someone is hesitant because they're a scotch or Japanese or whatever it is that they normally drink single malt wise. They haven't quite taken the plunge into American. Um, 
let's make let's make that transition as easy as possible and between the proof the price point and hopefully you know how they experience what's in the bottle that this is a you know nothing but a rewarding experience and yeah to make that list is pretty cool um to me for all of those reasons i really hope it moves kind of uh moves the chain down a little bit uh, well, for for the whole for the whole category i think this is a, that's a great place to kind of pivot because lineage is the people's champ you know for it to be on that list mm -hmm. You know, you mentioned the Pottsville bourbon and the reason you just perfectly laid out the reason for making lineage. I know when we do our spots, I love talking about lineage because I love single malts. And so I really like being able to recommend it to people or tell them about it or what the thought process was on it because all of the thing, uh, those things kind of enhance the experience. And so I wouldn't mind, since we're talking about lineage, kind of pivoting and doing single malt. I want to get to... Uh, the distillery's new release in a moment. But before we do that, I think it's a good way to set up uh, my single barrel uh, selection. And that is, it is a peated single malt. And I, I really want to hear you explain this, Jared, because I have some confusion myself about um, what you guys did with this and how you, you did it. In other words, the history, and I don't even know if they do it the same way now, but the history of peated has to do with scottish peat moss correct don't they like that and then the heat comes up and that's how you kind of get that taste going on when they're doing the uh the barley process and so my question is when you guys are doing this is a, pe a peated single malt um and so do you guys get uh get it from over there and it's already gone through that peating process or do you uh you know kind of do that over here how does all that work yeah, I don't know what episode we talked about our regular single malt way, way, way back to probably episode one or two. Um, but this, our, our peated, current our peated expressions that we've got laid down, it actually adds a whole other layer on top of how cool it is that we get to use the barley we use. So quick recap, short yeah. version. Um, we use Forsyth stills. Very classic Scottish pot stills, uh, pretty much ubiquitous for the making of single malt in the UK. Um, really, I mean, globally to a large to a large extent. Um, we use Golden Promise barley, which kind of fell out of favor in the late mid to late eighties um, for higher yielding, more modern uh, other hybrids that have literally just higher alcohol per pound, so more starch content, and not necessarily more tasty. So for all the whiskey guys that are out there that collect dusties, as we call them, which is the bottles that sit on the shelf in the little, uh, you know, out, on, on the beat, out of the beaten path uh, liquor store where you can go in and they've got something sitting for a while. Um, most single malt that was laid down between the mid 60s and the mid 80s was made with Golden Promise. And it's just kind of gone by the wayside for efficiency. It's a very industrial kind of modern uh, move to move away from something tasty for something that just literally makes more alcohol. Right. So um, at our size, it's always been really cool that we could be nimble enough to choose things based on flavor and not just um, yield. So <clears throat> from day one, we kind of chose to pick this grain and highlight something that's kind of gone. Um, so other than being made and aged and blended by a bunch of American dudes in Texas, the still that's used, the grain that's used, the process that's used is, is a throwback to how scotch was made. Um, in the mid 60s to the mid 80s. That said, it's a, a variety that's owned by one family. It's the Simpson family. And they uh, don't offer a peated version of Golden Promise. They have a couple of other varieties that they peat and sell commercially, uh, either Concerto or Epic, which are two other barley varieties. But we use Golden Promise for our regular single malt. And so when we decided to venture off into peated, we said, hey, we'd really like to only have that be the only variable. We'd really like this to be familiar in every other way, except for peat. Um, and they said, okay, so you got to buy a whole, a whole malting floor worth, which at the time we were down at our other building, not going to happen. That's a whole truck. That's like a shipping container worth of, worth of barley. But when we moved, as soon as we moved down here, it was like, yes, we can absolutely take that volume. Um, so the next step was what kind of peat level do we want? So yes, they're using peat moss. And the only reason that even happens is because there are certain parts of Scotland where that, that was the common fuel source. People burn peat 
in their fireplace. Mm -hmm. um, so if you have to heat barley in the malting process, which you do, to arrest the germination, just to halt it, you have to dry it out. Um, places that peat was their heat source, that's what they used. And so the smoke would get into the barley. And then when you make the whiskey with it, it's still there. Right. Um, so um, phenols, the parts per million, PPM, if you ever hear that, see that connected with peated whiskey, that's parts per million phenols, which phenols is a broad group. There's a ton of different um, compounds that are, that are phenols, but it's a generic way to talk about these smoky compounds. Um, but we had an opportunity to, to custom do that because they're doing it literally just for us. Wow. Which is also super rad to think about um, since maybe, you know, some 10 and 12 year old scotch is coming out in the mid nineties. Since then, no one's even laying down peated golden promise as whiskey in the world. Like, cause we're custom, we're having to custom order it. Right. Um, I tried, I told, I told our, our majority investor at Balcones, I told him I really needed some references so I could compare some peated golden promise um, bottlings. So we just have some context for what we're making and what we're releasing. Um, and the only thing I could find was, it was, uh, it was a Yamazaki from 1996 that was going for about three grand on at an auction. And I decided, you know, I don't know that we really need references that bad. <laughs> so in, in, in a weird way, it's hard for me to even know, I don't have a whole lot to compare it to. Um, the other thing about this, so this is we, we did 35 PPM the first time. Our second order, we did 66. And our third order, we did 99. That's PPM. Um, and this is a 99. This is, and we've stuck with the 99, which is a considered, that's a pretty high peat, high peat level yeah. um, relative to normal market stuff. Um, the other cool thing about this is that most people are familiar with Isla peat. So we talk about the, whisk, the regions of Scotland, mm -hmm. but people don't realize that there's also peat regions. This is Highland peat. This is okay. not this is not Island peat. So it doesn't have a lot of the brine saltwatery kind of stuff. It reads a little bit earthier. Highland peat does. It tends to read a little bit, uh, maybe a little bit nutty. Uh, I think Ben Riach is actually one of the best examples. If you go out and get the Curiositas, which is a 10 year old Ben Riach peated, it's a great example of Highland peat and what it does. Um, but yeah, so it's, it's, it's odd in about eight, eight or nine different ways and custom in about eight or nine different ways. Yeah. And then to your luck, uh, our normal expression, which we're about to get to is mostly aged in virgin oak, much like our regular single malt. Once again, to just highlight the difference that the peat is the difference. It's the same barley, same process, same barrels. Yours on the other hand was in a refill barrel and Alex might have to fill us in on barrel details because that's his wheelhouse. Um, but this wasn't virgin, I don't think, right? No, um, yeah, and then we also finished it in a Solterran cask, which is a, people think of dessert wines and they usually think of port and maybe sherry. Solterran mm -hmm. is like a lighter, kind of a peach apricot colored dessert wine that we're really, really big fans of here at the distillery. And we have a peated Solterran release planned as an expression from Balconies going forward but I, I have a hard time when I know I gotta bring some cool single malt samples to somebody and these are getting there. I, I yeah, so I, I pulled this one out. I kind of hoped you didn't pick it. <laughs> oh no, whoa, no! Because Why? it's, well, I mean, I don't know, cause I want it. You know? <laughs> <laughs> okay, it, so. It, go ahead, Ben, I'm I, sorry. Well, when I think back to that night when we were doing the barrel selections, you know, I, I've known Skin since we were 12. And he was excited, uh, as excited about that night as he's ever been at any point. And um, I know that the, the type of whiskey and scotch and those types of things that he likes. And you could sense that he was conflicted because he liked all three barrels. The one that he liked the most, he feared that it was maybe not mainstream enough, you know, for everyone to enjoy. And he's like, uh oh, is this, is this bad if I choose that? And I love the way that you guys encouraged him to go with whatever he wants and whiskey clubs exact same way like, no just go with what your what your heart's telling you and he was downright uh i would say giddy about it you know he was so excited about that selection and i'm so glad he went with his gut on that but that night tell us what you were thinking that night skin what emotions were you going through as you were trying to decide well you know uh i, I think you kind of described that perfectly but ultimately there was a feeling at the very end of like man i got 
something really, really unique and special that I'm going to be associated with. Like, and I really yeah. didn't do anything to deserve this or earn this. So it was, it was almost like, I don't know, finding some money in an old pair of jeans or something. It's just like that really unique feeling of uh, feeling special. Uh, and, and when you drink this, it's the kind of, uh, it's the kind of taste where it's like, you know, if your homeboy knows you're coming over and he's just stuck something back special for you, you know, like if, if there's two people that are way into something and they let me, you're not going to believe I have this. That's kind of like how I felt about it. And I also think it's, it's pretty interesting because I think, you know, on the nose, it's different than the taste. Pretty sick. Like I almost, I almost smell like a buttery kind of thing going on there. Yeah. Like brown, and, and, brown but, butter. But I, yeah. But I don't feel like I taste that at all. Um, Oh. Man, I think there's something so cool about um, so good. Peated, peated whiskey and, 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 and finishes and fr- just like fruit and acid and how that plays with smoke. Yeah, which is funny, which is funny because I, I I'm super not into like meat and fruit or meat and sweet stuff. Like I don't put syrup on my sausage. I don't want you know pineapple on my pizza. But there's something about smoke um, in peated whiskey that. Uh, yeah, I think there's something about finishes on that. The acid from the from the Sultaran, uh, it's just, it's cheesy, you know. I don't know. Yeah, there's a, there's a funk to it. There's and there, but there's still like yeah, grilled, some sort of a very much grilled quality, grilled fruit, grilled. Not peach. I was gonna say it, you end up with not not grilled. You know, a lot of Isla stuff. People talk about like seafood and 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 uh, yeah, it's grilled, but it's not. It might be fruit. It might be peaches or or pineapple or something, you know, yeah, which I, yeah. I love to throw on the grill, both of those every time. Yeah. So Jared, yeah. were, were you surprised when skin chose this one? No, I wasn't surprised. I, I, I mean, when I say I didn't want you to pick it, it's not like, I know what you mean. Yeah. If I didn't want you to pick it. I wouldn't have shown it to you. But, <laughs> right. right <laughs> yeah. Um, right. We, <laughs> yeah, it's probably a little bit of a marketing no, no when like, Hey, we've got stuff that we've laid down. We have a product planned for it for 2021. And then you sell a single barrel of it before we've even sold the expression. It's probably, it's probably well, a bad idea. That, that, that might be a cool place to pivot to the new. Yeah. Pivot. It's the um, new style. And just so you guys can see, I have not tasted this yet. Uh, I've had this in my possession for, I believe, about a week and a half, but I didn't want to taste it until I tasted it with you guys. Cool. Because... Um, you know, we've talked about this before. The, the peated is my favorite, and that's obviously what led to the single barrel um, for me. Uh, but this is very exciting. So let's talk about the new peated single malt that people will be able to buy on the shelves in multiple places and not just in a small limited run like that. Yeah, so this is also going to be a, a run of the 99 PPM peated Golden Promise. Uh, Simpsons Golden Promise. This is uh, age stated at three years old. I think it's a mix of three and four year old stuff. Um, we've only done this three years in a row. The first year was two years old. Second year was three years old. This year, the age statement is still three, but we had some of the four year old left over from the original batch. Um, so this is going to be much more like uh, our regular Texas one single malt in the sense that it's it's mostly virgin oak. Yeah. Um, and so in a weird way, we're stepping on all kinds of traditions, or you could look at it as we're combining kind of uh, influences. So we have a, a lot of very traditional Scottish single malt influence with the everything about the process from yeast to barley to peat levels to stills, everything. Um, and then we throw it in a bunch of virgin oak, which is, an, there's probably some European and French in there, but mostly going to be American oak virgin, which is uh, how usually bourbon and rye are treated, not how single malts are usually uh, matured. So um, this is a bottle of cask. So this is 62, 62.8. Um, and once again, the, I think some of the Highland versus Island and Isla coastal peat variations show pretty, pretty heavy. If you're expecting, you know, salt water and seaweed and, you know, whitefish, that's not what you're going to get out of Highland peat. Um, and then you throw it on virgin oak. And now all of a sudden, some of that stuff is dancing with tobacco notes and suede and you know well furniture polish you know this, this is this is really uh, a smooth drink i think i i think i thought maybe it was going to be i don't know 
livelier, or maybe it's coming off of what I just tasted uh, with the single barrel. Um, but yeah, th this is this is really really evened out um, in co in comparison to what we were just drinking on the single barrel. I would say. Yeah, I, the density, and I mean, it, it might be hard to see on screen. Virgin oak has so much soluble stuff that ends up in the whiskey literally i mean just solids a lot of wood sugar uh caramelized sugar um so it probably i think it reads a little bit less smoky just because in context yes. it's not that the smoke level's down it's just all these other things are also up you know um and instead of really nice kind of fruity wine tannins and, and acidity we've got barrel tannins which read a little bit more like um you know, overbrewed tea, uh, some of those kind of like a like a like a sun tea, that to help balance some things out. And in general, the virgin oaks to me seem less smoky. Yeah, even though, even though they're exactly the same, it's just just context bring kind of. And and that's just, is that a matter? That's a matter of what's going on with the barrel, Jared. That's what that's yeah. what the significant difference is. Yeah, yeah. The all that color and body that we're getting from from wood components that are soluble in alcohol or water now they're in there which of course that's where all the color comes from anyway so in a, re in a used barrel you have just a lot less of that to, to contribute so those barrels tend to aerate they tend to oxidize they tend to esterify whereas um in virgin you get a, just a ton of contribution from the wood itself which honestly in a smoky whiskey i think is super complimentary you get you get just burnt you get smoke notes and then you also get this all these this 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 nice spectrum of other wood flavor and aroma contributions um for not being finished i feel like wood tannin sometimes in the right context uh can end up reminding you of kind of a vinous like a grapey a whiny um it can imply kind of some grape and kind of berry type type stuff yeah um, you get I like that what you said skin about it being leveled out yeah, it does. It does. It is. It is a lot uh, smoother than I was expecting for whatever reason. It's very chill. Um, Sixty-two eight. It does not. I mean, it's it's pretty drinkable for six. Yeah, yeah. Very, yeah. very, very drinkable. Uh, drinkable. Very approachable. And Alex, when is this stuff going to be on the shelves? Is it on the shelves now? Or do you do you know what this is going to cost? Do you know any of the, that type of stuff? Uh, it is actually in the process, is in transit from the distillery now all across Texas. Um, it'll be available sometime next week. Uh, it'll probably retail around the 75 to 79, um, you know, 79.99 mark. So it'll be, it should be available at all the, you know, all your standard spots, your, your local hangouts. This is really special. I mean, yes, this is great. great. This is unbelievable. Yeah, you know, it's fun to, Ben, I think, I think I saw you do it. Um, it's fun to go back and forth. Um, and yeah. I know li listeners can't, can't do this yet. Um, but to go back and forth between Skins Barrel um, and the, the Peated, because I feel like you can, very different. You, can, you can smell, you pick up, a, I think, a little more of the acidity in the Sautern Barrel. And then coming over to the Peated, uh, the standard Peated release, I, I feel like it's more of like that caramelized sugar grilled meat quality, uh, like maybe lighter meat, not like beef, but like pork. I don't, maybe something a little bit, yeah. a little bit lighter. That's caramelized sweetness to it. Um, that's still chewy um, and savory, um, earthy kind of quality. Hey, yeah, um, I I, yeah, I mentioned the uh, like cigar notes, and maybe it's because I was just having one earlier, but um, some of that overlaps to me with almost like balsamic, you know. Oh, like, yeah. um, so I'm not, I don't typically lean towards uh, a peated taste, uh, it, but I freaking love this. So, I mean, I, yeah, this might be immediately right at the top with one of my favorites of all time. You know how your, uh, you know how your uh, tongue feels after you've been drinking like a big, bold red wine? You know that feel? I'm, I ha I'm having that same feeling on my tongue. Like, you know, where you get it like in the middle part of your tongue after you, you know. Same more. Keep going. Yeah. So I, I don't I don't know how to describe that sensation or why it's leading me there. But like if you drink like a like a Bordeaux or something, like your tongue has this uh, almost like this nice smooth coating in the middle of it, and that same thing is happening in drinking this. Do you know why that would be? 
Is it like a is it like a sticky kind of salivating thing or is it like a dry it's like a salivating thing? Okay. Yeah, that's probably just wood sugar. You're literally salivating. I mean, um, hemicellulose and lignin, which are parts of the part of the tree, part of the wood, um, during the charring and toasting process are broken down just like when you caramelize anything at home, whether it's onions or you know, dairy to make caramels. So um, it's literally wood sugar. Humans don't process these things, but caramelized, they break down into simpler sugars and we can, and they, they, they're soluble in alcohol and water and they end up in the whiskey, which is, uh, contributes to body, sweetness, color, uh, all the above. That's just great. crack this with like a, just a drop or two of water. And it's amazing how different it is that even from how it was prior to those couple drops of water, yeah. I like it even more. It's even more smoothed out and, I can really taste a, a sweetness in it that I don't typically find personally uh, in, in the more peated things. I mean, this is truly extraordinary. I'm going to love most, this. Most peated releases are in pretty, pretty used refill, you know, bourbon barrels. So they're very pale. So they don't, the, the whiskey gets to develop in, in, in all the other cool maturation ways, but it doesn't, it doesn't get a lot of wood contribution. So we're getting a lot more tannin and we're getting a lot more wood sugar. Um, we've kind of got, I'm surprised you didn't mention it. The smoke is out front, so it's not it's not anywhere as as holiday as the rumble probably. But there's there's some cool clovey stuff. You know how you guys ever use the clove stuff for your kids when they're teething? You know, and it numbs the gums or whatever. The That's clove been a million years. Wait, yeah. wait what? Yeah. <laughs> we're we're old, Jared. <laughs> I think I'm older than you, but I also have a two year old. <laughs> You're not older than us, I promise. Yeah, Picasso nobody's here. older than Ben. Trust. Yeah. No one's older than me. <laughs> but um but clove clove has a numbing effect as well so it's kind of a cool thing with with spirits when you get a clove note you can kind of taste it but a little bit of it is also a feeling when you kind of get this numbing uh, tingle from the from the alcohol that's pretty cool um i get a little bit of licorice but i also like i have my i have my like pet flavors that i look for because i just love them and like a licorice anise uh, fennel thing is right down my alley so i look for it but i get a little bit there's some herbal stuff going on here maybe well, well, maybe it's more cardamom than, than fennel but so why would this uh be such a different taste than the 2019 peated that you guys put out what is the well, main differentiation there um well you know blending is what it is it, we the first year we released stuff it was just barely two years old the second release now the same stock that we didn't use. We had three-year-old stuff and we had some younger stuff too, but we decided, you know, let's go ahead and make it three. This year we had some from the very first batches. So we had four-year-old stuff to mix in. Um, we learned a few things over four years messing with this. Right. Um, and, and some of it's just blending, you know, some stuff just needs to be combined in the right way. And it's, it's super non-linear. Me and Gabe, my blending buddy, we probably ought to have him on the show at some point because he's, he's, he's super instrumental to to helping me get done we should. The, he's, he's fun. What, I, what I do. Um, turns out he's also halfway likable. So that's, that's convenient. <laughs> Decent conversationalist uh, and not bad to look at. But <laughs> we were working on, um, we've been working on Mirador, which is our all refill, you know, yeah. uh, release awesome. for, for Q1 or 2021. We've been working on it and it's our most delicate thing. We also care a lot about it. There's a lot of emotional connection to the product. And we were just stressing out. There's not that many barrels out. There's maybe like 80, 100 barrels out here. And I just been slaving on it for weeks and just super frustrated. And just, if you think you're just going to add this and this together and one plus one equals two in the blending room, it's just like, man, where did that, all of a sudden the finish is like super peppery or something. Like none of the barrels taste like that. Um, but there's a synergy that you kind of can't, I mean, you, you learn some things you can, you can guide a little bit, but. You still got to do a little trial and error and some things just don't go how you expect and there's surprises all along the way so with this one um i was happy that we had a, a, a broader palette to paint with than we have any other year um and going forward that's only going to get better um so yeah i um i didn't want this to read too per, super wood smoky obviously we've got brimstone and sometimes the peat and wood smoke can be very similar right so i, I tried to avoid um the stuff that read more like wood the stuff that read more like peppers chilies um which are kind of hallmark notes of of that product um yeah i don't know i'm freaking we, out man 
I'm freaking out over here. I can't even believe how much I love this. Uh, <laughs> it is, and it's, and it's insane to me that this is 125 proof and so approachable, so drinkable. I cracked it with a little bit of water and I'm a guy who drinks a lot of cocktails. I like to mix the, you know, this is unbelievably drinkable and approachable for 125 proof. Um, mm -hmm. I just don't, I mean, if I had made this, I would be wearing it on a necklace everywhere. <laughs> I would just be like, uh, did you see what I made? You guys got to mm -hmm. taste this. I mean, it is insinely good, man. I'll be right, like, man, uh, you're such a rapper. That's <laughs> it'd be like, uh, the uh, Tom Hanks and, uh, when he finally made the fire on the island, it's like I made, I, this. I made this. I made this. Okay, so <sighs> how? How? But is is most stuff that's 125 proof is not sophisticated and delicious and approachable like this, right? That's hard I to mean, do, right? I I mean, there's there's some there's some nuance to get to getting that done. Um, like I said, for scotch, you're not going to find a lot of scotches in that proof anyway. Um, but yeah, we're you know, we're doing pot still as opposed to column, which a lot of the stuff you're going to find at this kind of proof is going to be Kentucky bourbons that are high, that, that high. Um, and there's a, there's a tightness. There's a, there's an edge that pot still whiskeys have a lot of the natural oils retained. We're not chill filtering all that stuff. So they can be a little bit rounder. They can be a little bit gooier for lack of a better word, which kind of softens some things up, but also your cuts. I mean, your cuts do matter. Um, and then lastly, for us, I mean, sitting here in the blending room, the blending does matter. And like trying to figure out, um, we do a lot of weird stuff. I mean, we transfer barrels out of their original barrel. We dilute things in barrel. Uh, we're checking things all the time. So I would probably need Gabe here to, to, to know what did we do different. But when we check things at two years, at three, sometime you're like, man, that thing's going to get away from us. It needs to be chilled out a little bit. You move it to a different rack, you move it from a high to a low rack, you move it for a different floor in the warehouse, you drop it from barrel proof to 59%, like soften it up a little bit, let it keep maturing, but let it be kind of chill and not too aggressive, um, which is not the easy way to do this job, but uh, yeah, yeah, it's, it, yeah, we're just kind of, we're kind of holding these barrels hands most of the time and, and trying to figure out um, where they want to go and what they want to be. That's the other thing, the nice thing about some of these special releases, unlike some of our core stuff, we kind of get to follow the spirit. Um, we got to get to follow the whiskey where it wants to go a little bit, you know, and it, you, you know, it's not completely uneducated guesses. We know a few things, but you're still learning. And so there's a little bit of a dialogue, just like we were talking about earlier between the producer and the consumer and flattening that there's a little bit of, Hey, you know, these seem like they want to go in a certain direction and how do we kind of coach how do we kind of shepherd those things to be the best version of that and not just end up with a train wreck um but also not fighting and you're not battling this stuff you know you're not enemies this is a the, the, the everything from the still to the weather to the microflora in the air that gets in the fermentations the barley you're, you're all partners and trying to get this thing done and you got to get to know each other a little bit you got to have a few little conversations, little sidebars here and there and be like, Hey man, you know, what's going on? Where are you headed? What are you thinking? Uh, and then figure out where the overlap is. And, and then you, that's where you end up going. That's how you make your map. But I, I really dig this release as a fan of Peated. Peated, how is it? Peated was how I got into scotch, uh, how I got into whiskey period. I was a beer guy. Didn't like whiskey. Didn't really like spirits other than tequila and mezcal until, um, until it was our big, our big 10 was for me. So to get her come full circle and be able to do, um, to do peated releases is, is, is kind of like, it, it feels like I've kind of come home. So there, there's like, I, you know, for Ben and I, our social group, uh, the guys that we hung out with growing up, the first whiskey that we all started drinking was crown Royal. And so when we started, you know, branching off and doing other things, uh, scotch was the first thing that I really sort of explored. Um, is it because of the purple bag? Is it really because of the bag? <laughs> I think it was because, I don't know, you know, the whole idea of ordering a crown and Coke sounded like something you were supposed to be doing when you first were allowed to go into bars. Right. Um, uh, which, you know, drink what you like. I'm, I'm not, uh, I'm not making any judgments, but when you kind of start going off and exploring things, I actually was kind of going off down the Scotch road first before I came back and then started hitting all the bourbon stuff and trying to learn, a little more about that so maybe that has 
I don't know, some sort of nostalgic reason as to why I do lean towards the single malts and stuff. But um, I, I feel like this whiskey talk has almost kind of come full circle because we were talking about the lineage and I feel really, really good recommending the lineage to people for a lot of different reasons. You know, Ben and I always have these conversations about it, depending on a person's experience level with different types of whiskey, what, what do we recommend to them and why in the Balcones family? Uh, and so I've really enjoyed hipping people to lineage, but I think, you know, seeing Ben's reaction and kind of tasting it myself, I think it's going to be fun to get people to explore this, uh, 2020 version of what you guys are doing with the peat. We, we might, yeah. If we ever get around and to doing single barrels with you guys, again, it sounds like we might have to do, uh, we, you guys both have, both might have to be looking at peated. <laughs> yeah. You're in the, you're in the club now, Ben, you're screwed. You're peated all <laughs> Bro, over I, here. I'm so blown away. I, di I didn't know what to expect. Uh, honestly, uh, when I saw it and I saw the bottle and I saw the word peated, I was like, okay, this is going to be really high end. It might be a little bit sophisticated for my personal palate based on things I've liked in the past and whatnot. And I couldn't believe how approachable and drinkable it was. Like it, it I am absolutely in love. So I don't know if I've graduated. I, I don't know if I'd advanced <laughs> to the next chapter, but I freaking love this product, man. This is exceptional. I, I think, I think that's, that's kind of part of, I mean, this is, uh, you know, this is, uh, I think Jonathan reminded us, this is a uh, whiskey talk number eight, but, um, we've gone, we've gone through a lot of different whiskeys, uh, in all eight of these, including the single barrels. Um, and so it's, it's fun to be able to talk about this peated release. Cause it is, it's, it's very delicious. And again, it'll be available, um, for the most part, probably towards the end of next week, but, I think that there is something too, of course, just that this is a really great whiskey. It is very drinkable, very approachable, chewy, delicious. Uh, it kind of goes to the spectrum of savory, sweet. Um, but I think, right, Ben, uh, it's a testament to, right, just exploring new things and willing to say like, look, I'm a novice. I don't know, but I'm going to give this, I'm going to give this a try. And, uh, and yeah, to a certain degree, it's kind of like, that's what the whole whiskey talk thing about is about, right. Is, is being able to kind of knock down some of those barriers of, man, I think this is way too sophisticated for me. And it's like, no, no, not at all. Let's just, let's just try it. Um, and you know, it's like, I, I, I love sports, but I know I'm talking to two guys that know way more about sports, uh, three. than I do. And you know, that's three Jared guys that know skin. more. Yeah. Jared's skin. Yeah, Jared's skin. <laughs> is what I meant by that. Um, you know, so it's like, but I love sports, right. But I don't get to talk to Tony Romo and, you know, hang out with Dirk. So, um, yeah, it's just, I think that's like the fun exploration of it, Ben is just being able to be like, look, this is what I normally like, but there's something special about that. And I think that's like, what's really cool about really whiskey in general and, and being able to kind of knock down those barriers and at the end of the day, just sip good whiskey together and have a good conversation. But I, I think the brand is approachable. And I think I'm comfortable talking about that journey because it's approachable. Like we're sitting here talking to the head distiller and he couldn't be more chill and laid back. And he's not going to judge me no matter what I say. And I'm just on this journey. And you, all he's talked about is flattening that curb and actually reaching the consumer. So I don't know. I think it says a lot about your brand and who you guys are. And uh, you guys are all about people taking that journey. You're not like judging anyone for how they drink or what they like. You're just kind of, there with them along that journey. I mean, yeah, if it, it, it's like a, it's like a ton of other things that I won't go into. Uh, but this idea of kind of like super hard edge kind of gatekeeping on whatever communities you might be a part of, whatever hobbies you're into, whatever politics you're into. Um, I would think that the goal would be uh, to be invitational, to be warming, to be welcoming. Um, if, if I ever meet somebody who was in a spot that I used to be at, at some previous stage of life, I hope I would have the grace <laughs> and the empathy to be like, Hey, you know, and not be a jerk about it. But, um, I, I, think well, I, I, I want to say, I want to say this right quick. Uh, I think, and I think I've shared this with you guys before. Maybe I haven't, but the guy that really started educating me on stuff, is a really kick-ass drummer that now lives out in Fort Worth named Pete. He's a badass drummer. And I know Ben's heard me say this, and he told me the most important thing as we were getting into this is I was asking him, are you supposed to do this? And he said, 
you're supposed to drink it however you want to drink it. It's your mouth. Don't let anybody tell you to put it on ice or not put it on ice or whatever. Try those things and see what you like, but don't let ever let anybody judge you as to how you want to enjoy what you're enjoying. And I do think that that's, that was a really great lesson uh, that I learned early on. Just really that, like what you're talking about, the whole idea of don't worry about what people are going to think about the way that you're throwing down on it. This is your experience. Right. Uh, and, and, I think we've gotten into some weird technical stuff over some episodes and that's fine. I love the idea that people should be equipped with the information, the facts and the science that they need. And after you have that, if you know, Hey, when I ice it, for example, it's just an objective fact. You've brought the evaporation point down. The aroma is going to be less expressive, but some other things are going to be really enhanced. That's cool. That's just facts. Yeah. And if that's how you like it, then that's cool. But let's not, you know, let's not pretend that some of these, there, there are ramifications to all these different ways of doing things. Here they are. And you can be like, yeah, but, you know, it turns out I still like that. Right. You know, it's not quite like someone who likes their steak well done because that's fucking, you know. <laughs> that's a crime. <laughs> hey, well, no, some things are, cr- are criminal. That's a Yeah, crime. right. There, we, should, we, should, we should have an island that we ship those. <laughs> That's not true. That's not fair at all. Um, but, but to some degree, yeah. The, and, and the main thing is, I think, is not encouraging, to me, not encouraging answers. Arm people, they can be better consumers. They can enjoy whiskey more if they are armed. They have the information. They need to know what we know. Yeah. And anybody, that, anybody that's kind of gatekeeping that and trying to like keep this kind of Wizard of Oz, like, no, behind the screen, I'm just like a little dude with like moving levers. But no, you should think, you know, it's Emperor with no clothes, right? Um, no, like share that, empower people so that they can have the exact same, they can have the, whatever level of, of enjoyment and a whiskey experience they want to have Yeah, um, is important to me. And then now, yeah, man, go do whatever, the, go do whatever you want now. You have all the information you need to make good decisions but also encouraging people. And this is where it comes into, this isn't really just about whiskey. You could not like whiskey. That's fine. You could not be in the spirits. That's fine. But some of the other things that go, go into getting it made and getting it to uh, really maximizing your appreciation of it are applicable. Just these are, these are just life things, but slow down, everybody slow down, really be where you are. Pay attention to what's in front of you, whether that's a walk in the park, you know, your kid talking to you, uh, 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 an album you just bought or the whiskey that's in the bottle, just give it a chance to be the only thing. Give it a chance to be the focal point. And then you can really start trusting. I actually like it this way as opposed to a really unexamined uh, kind of off the cuff way of appreciating things. Like, no, 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 really dig in. Put, you invest a little bit. Trust me, it'll give you back just as much as you've put in and now you it's not one plus one equals two you've just exponentially increased how much this matters to you and how enjoyable it is to you no matter what it is whiskey or freaking sunset or you know that uh, blue note continuum album you just got whatever it is like give it a chance to be the one thing that's happening right now you know don't take a walk in the park with headphones in be be in the park you know uh, sorry, rant over as a, as a, a, as, a, as, a as a cyclist as a cyclist commuter. I would like for you to take your headphones out because you never hear me coming when I'm trying to pass you on the trail. So. It's that thing they tell you the first couple semesters of film school. It's cool if you want to break the rules. Just make sure you know why you're breaking them in the first place. Well, you know, I did ceramics. I did a visual art degree, and anybody who's not familiar, people love to throw shade at like Pollock and Picasso. And I know my kid could do that. If you've never gone and looked at Picasso's figure drawings, like, yeah, yeah, he 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 definitely earned the right to break the rules. Right. His like almost photographic level, like chalk drawings of real people, is just unbelievable. But yeah, um, I saw the same thing in art school. People were just like, oh, I want to express myself. It's like, yeah, you don't even know, you don't even have the tools, you know. Right. Um, it's and, your foundation, baby. Yeah, and we talk about this with sports all the time. And you guys know I'm I'm almost 100% uh, basketball guy. But I won't name names, but there's the same thing. There's the same thing that goes on. Like, it's like talent, talent. I want to express myself. And anybody who's like a vet coach or media is looking at this guy and going, man, there's a bunch of holes in this guy's game. Hmm. 
is he okay with hearing that? Is he going to work on that? Or is he just going to go with, here's what I'm really good at. I'm like naturally talented at X. That's fine. You might not, you know, have the career that you're hoping for. You might not end up being this well-rounded player if you don't hear that and spend the off season working on some of those, some of those holes in your game. But It ain't, it ain't fine when they take that stuff away from you that you do well. All right. Yeah. Uh, I, I like this idea. I'd like to throw out, and you can jump in on this too, Jared, but I was thinking about mm-hmm. aiming it towards uh, Alex and that's the idea of give me a couple of bottles. I think uh, Ben and I talk about this. The best gift you can give anybody is something experiential. And a lot of times something that the two of you can share together, which I love the idea. I, I saw how excited Ben got on this new PETA. I was like, how cool would it be to buy a bottle of that for somebody that you love and share it with them and see that reaction? So uh, give me a couple of good Balcones gift ideas. I was When you said that, I looked down at the um, calendar and I was like, man, this is going to be on the shelves by December 18th or so. There's still time for a Christmas gift. So throw a couple out there right quick. Um. I mean, the, I think the obvious thing here is lineage. Um, just because the Whiskey Advocate um, Top 20 is is pretty cool. Um, and it, it is validating because they touched on, in, in an interview, they touched on um, the price point, the approachability, and it's just really good. Um, we love this whiskey. Um, as you can tell, I've, en- I've enjoyed um, the majority of this bottle. Um, I, I think lineage is great and, you know, and something that's around 39, you know, price point, I think it's very approachable to, to most folks. Uh, and then, uh, I, I do think just because, I mean, I hate to say, cause just cause we're talking about it, but, um, there are some really cool single barrels out there right now, um, across, uh, quite a few of the stores. I think those are really fun because you're, you're kind of navigating a lot of really fun nuances between casks, whether it's true blue cask, a lot of the new high plane single barrels, um, hundred percent Texas malted barley have just hit stores. I saw some of those today. Um, but it's, it's hard not to just geek out over peated single malt. So, um, I, it, you know, I'm, it's kind of one extreme to the other, uh, uh, as far as, uh, um, price and proof. But I think that's like the, the beauty of it too, is you're looking at something that's very approachable, still very complex at a very approachable price point and proof and then you're looking at something that's special and really extreme as far as the the proof and just the overall uh, complexity of it so um i'm, I'm gonna go with two single malts lineage and peated love it love yeah it. Love you it. know i thought the idea would be like hey go get ben and skin single barrels but if you know there's no already, more if stuff's already <laughs> sold out then i guess that's yeah. not really an issue um, yeah yeah the next <laughs> ones the next set of barrels that we do maybe that's well that's later. Is that a Valentine's Day gift? Or are we gonna do this again? Ooh, I don't, I don't, I don't know. Uh, so I was at a really weird event um, oh, uh, last year where oh. uh, it was a tombstone, oh, uh, themed thing uh, out in north, kind of northeast Austin. And there was this, there was this ghost town, and they rented it out, and Val Kilmer showed up, and it had like a blow up. Uh, wow. big screen outdoor viewing of tombstone um but the only reason i mentioned any of that is because you just said is this a valentine's so what do we do about? and in my mind i went immediately to say when oh <laughs> yes i love but, it i love it but i did realize we've gone over and we have not talked about music at all oh yeah and not that, that's kind of a i, I think that's weird you know, know I'm always game. You have a particular place you want to go here? No, I was kind of hoping to see. When was the last time we did this? It's It's been a little bit. Been a month? Uh, Over a month? I feel like that was October when we did was this. It, oh, was it two months? I don't I know. Think so. Maybe. March 2020 to December 2020 is like the same. It's all the same day, basically. Yeah. Well, um, uh, I know a good place to dive in, and yeah. that is uh, – Raise your hand if you've produced a soundtrack for one of the best movies in 2020. Ooh. That's right. Did y'all know that? One of, uh, this is uh, all publications that you're seeing out there. They talk about the greatest movies of 2020. Uh, they're talking about this movie, Shit House, which was made by University of University of Texas student uh, who wrote this and wrote, directed, and starred in this movie. 
And he was smart enough to hire Jeff Skin Wade to produce the soundtrack for him. And that just happened to be his uncle. Well, That's awesome. Ben, ben, ben is, uh, <coughs> is, yeah. Oh, oh my God, you got it right there. That's my nephew Cooper right there on the left. That's uh, Dylan Galula on the right. So if you like small little independent movies, uh, Shit House is a movie my nephew made about a freshman, a college freshman that's struggling with his experience. Um, but he, uh, I can't, I kind of came in at the tail end to help him do the things he couldn't quite get over the goal line music wise. But a lot of it was stuff he figured out and he came up with, and he's just got an older uncle that's done some of this stuff. So I, I helped him at the end, but this is, this is his vision. And I think on the soundtrack, we even say executive produced by Cooper Reif, who's my nephew and Jeff Skinway, and then Luke Sardello, who's the guy at Josie records at, you know, we do stuff together on that, but um, there's a really cool artist on there uh, named Zero Fret. And that's actually a kid that Cooper went to high school with. And he's got some great songs on there. And my favorite thing on there is the song Walk All Over Me, which is a song that his buddy Jack from Zero Fret did. And then it's not listed in there anywhere. I'll just tell you guys something that he's not saying but Cooper helped craft the lyrics to that song. Hmm. And then Abby Quinn, who is a really good young actress, she's in the uh, Mad About You reboot. She's hmm. in um, a movie called After the Wedding, where she holds her own along Billy Crudup and Michelle Williams and uh, 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 Helen Moore. I was saying, yeah, yeah. Um, and so anyways, Abby sings... What's that? Shit house. <laughs> Shit house. But it's it's a it's a very charming small budget movie, and we're all incredibly proud of my nephew. And uh, Vanity Fair had it in the top ten for the year. Oh, dang. And, yeah, that's really cool. And then um, Huffington Post had it as one of the seventeen best movies of the year. And so the the he's gotten some nice accolades. We're all very very proud of the boy. Shit, yeah. That's yeah. super cool. Shit house, yeah. You can find it on Amazon Prime or Apple Download Tunes, whatever they call yeah. their thing. Download Tunes. What do you? Was, what are you been just, listening to? I was just assuming, like, it's been a while. I, surely, there's some new releases that have come out that people are excited about. Um, I've got two that just with literally no uh, no planning whatsoever. Okay. I've got I've got pretty weird interests, and I've talked with at least Skin enough to know he's got pretty weird uh broader than people might expect yes. uh on the on the metal front sumac oh people that are fans of aaron turner's work he was previously from isis uh their re most recent album may you be held is really beautiful and brutal cool. but also on the hip-hop front i man early 2000s late 90s early 2000s especially some of the def jux new york stuff that was going on yes aesop rock just dropped a new record that is really 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 nice and worth a solid listen oh wow that's really cool so are you i mean they're obviously a big deal but you know that same uh funnel uh uh jamie lp from run the jewels and i think most sure. people are aware of run yep. the jewels Absolutely. Uh, comes from that same family. So that's a really, really yeah. cool thing for sure. Hey, wait a second. I want to clarify something too. Uh, your nephew didn't go to Texas. Where'd he go? He went to Occidental, which is a small liberal arts college in LA, but uh, his mother and father went to UT with your older brother. Yes. You know, you know, you know, I was th saying that because uh, his movie won South by Southwest. I think yes. that's why Oh. I was thinking Austin. Yeah. No, I, I, yeah, I'm glad you brought that up, Ben. Uh, South by Southwest was virtual this year, and Cooper they they won best film. Like so, you you got to keep in mind they you know they get over they get thousands of entries, and then they narrow it down. And he when he actually made the what they call the narrative competition uh, competition, which is the ten best narrative films of the year in the mind of South by Southwest. We thought that was astonishing. And then he won. And like, we just didn't know what to do with ourselves. We were like, that's, man. That's, this that's like how we made it into the top 20, but he actually like got the number one. You, you know what it's like? No, it's like you guys went in the 2014 Taste of Scotland. Is <laughs> yeah, that's right. 
It's like uh, uh, his movie uh, winning a blind viewing of it. Uh, <laughs> a blind taste test. Here. Blind people love his movie. <laughs> Great. Good, Good sound. I, th- uh, I, th- I think, yeah, I think there's like a best whiskey thing in South by, but yeah, I don't think we ever won it. <laughs> but, uh, thank you for bringing that up, Ben. I would love for everybody yeah. to watch my nephew's movie. And, and just remember the name Cooper Rife because he's doing some really big things now. The boy is becoming a man. It's pretty awesome. It's pretty, pretty awesome. We're all very proud of him. Anybody else, anybody else got album drops and yeah, album releases they want to throw out? There, there, I like to mention this this time of year. Um, it's a, it's Let's a, go. Um, oh. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's a it's a very deep song about the emotion of Christmas, and it is called "Let's Go Farting in a Santa Suit." And it's yeah. on Spotify, and it's very I special. Was, I knew where this was going. Yeah, it's a very special song. There's my daughter. There's my daughter Grace. She's a Spotify model. I love it. It's, you know, it's really ironic because my wife, my wife, just my texted wife. me. Uh, that our dog is farting in the bedroom and stinking up the bedroom. Um, yeah. So it's a very fortuitous moment that you yeah. would uh, talk about Santa and his expletives. He, uh, yeah, you know, it's uh, farting and dogs and Santa. They're all working together in this magical <laughs> holiday time. Yeah. Yeah. Text, her, text her, she doesn't have to blame it in the do- on the dog when you're not in there. Nice. It's her fault, not the dog's fault. Uh, I'll, I'll throw some. I don't know if you guys are Beatles fans. I love the Beatles. That's not, you know, uh, going out in some uh, uncharted territory. But earlier I was talking about how much I've enjoyed experiencing Billie Eilish through my daughter. Uh, because, you know, I can listen to it and I, I like this or I don't like this part or I do like this part. But seeing the way that she receives all that, how it makes her feel and all those things just kind of heightens my experience. Well, uh, if you go, I, I don't know that it's on Spotify. Maybe it is. But if you go pull it up on uh, the, you know, it's, on, it's all over YouTube or whatever. It was a serious XM thing. But she does a cover of the Beatles something. And it's, oh. uh, it's really, really beautiful. Uh, that's, a, that's a cool thing that, that I would recommend people check out if they get a chance. That, that is cool. The, yep. the, the only thing that I was in skin, you and I kind of talked about it for a brief second before the horde of people raced in to grab bottles, but um, Central Track, which is a yes. publication uh, in the DFW area, um, they did a uh, um, the best Dallas songs of the yeah. 2010s, um, which is super cool because there's, there's folks on here like, of course, Erica Badu, Sarah Jaffe, Paul Cawthon, Leon Bridges, Power Trip, yeah, so they really they were number seven, I think. Uh, Executioner's song was number seven, I yeah. believe. Yeah, Executioner's Tax, yeah. Um, they, they even, of course, they, they went kind of like, if you're to a certain degree, it's like St. Vincent, which has some really great Dallas ties, uh, Annie, um, even Post Malone. Um, but there's a lot of like really great small artists on there um, that it, it's, it's super cool. Oh, yeah, and they made a playlist for it. And there's a lot of really great, like, oh, there's a ton of Oak Cliff rap which is really cool in hip hop. Uh, but there's a lot of like indie and punk and even oh. some like weird ska stuff, like all in the mix. So yeah. I, that sounds a really cool release. No, you brought up something that I want to throw out there. Cause I'm very excited about this person. Um, so do you guys know who Shay Serrano is that writes for the ringer? Um, I might have one of his books back here. He does these, he does these really great books and um, the, the guy who illustrated it is from out of Oak Cliff. It's a dude named Arturo. Uh, is, it the, the, is it that children book that you posted? No, no, no. Oh, yeah, that's great. Uh, our, me and Ben have a buddy named Bavu Blakes that lives in Austin, and he wrote a book. His son wrote it. Bavu helped him uh, realize it, but it's called – his son's name is Ellison. It's called El's Mirror, and it's the perspective of basically an eight-year-old and what happens when he sees his reflection in the mirror and deals with things at school. That's so cool. Highly – Highly recommend that. Thank mm-hmm. you for bringing that up. But Shea Serrano is a writer for The Ringer, and he gave out these, um, I guess they were sort of endowments or grants to do these small publishing deals. And he opened it up on his Twitter account and had six people. He was going to pick six and had everybody pitch him. And Taylor Crumpton's a girl, uh, a lady. She's in her mid 20s, I'm guessing. Uh, she was recently on CNN. She writes for The Undefeated. 
Uh, she writes for music and sports websites, but she's from Oakland and Dallas, went back and forth. And she's an extraordinary young writer. And she pitched writing about Big Tux, the Purple Hulk. Oh. And was got one of these, you brought up Oak Cliff Rat. Yeah, uh, that uh, that came out in 2006, I think. And she got one of those six grants. So you can go download. I'll blast it out after Whiskey Talk. But I not only love uh, supporting local artists, but I love supporting local writers as well, because I think all of this thing is synergistic. and Absolutely. People that care enough about music to want to write about it are my kind of people in the first place. I, our kind of people. So, so yeah, thanks Absolutely. for bringing that up. That's good, man. Texas hip hop. It's good stuff. Any honor, right. you know. Cheers, boys. I enjoyed it. I look forward to when we get to do this again. Uh, no offense to anybody watching, but we'll probably be talking to one another before we actually talk to you guys again, because that's a good thing to do. Yeah, so. yeah. Good guys, this was guys awesome in person. Thank you, guys. This was yeah, no doubt. Uh, so the vaccine goes well, and everybody's back, and the world's normal again. Uh, let's head up to Waco. Yo. Uh, let, let's yeah. uh, let's do make a show, from, do a show from here. Yeah, let's go. Done. Do it. We'll do a Friday show there, and then we'll stay there all weekend, and uh, we'll uh, we'll taste a bunch of different barrels. Sounds awesome. Cool, cool guys. All right, Let's later, you guys. Bye, Bye internet. Guys.